Subscribe to the channel and also press the bell icon to never miss an update from Endeavor Careers. Hello and welcome to Endeavor's GK Capsule for the month of July 2022. In this edition, we will discuss the global economic situation amidst rising inflationary pressures and slowdown in growth across key economies as well as latest developments from the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, among other things. The first category is Awards and Recognition. Last month, Japanese government announced its decision to honour former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe with the country's highest decoration, the collar of the Supreme Order of the Chrysanthemum, posthumously. Shinzo Abe will be the fourth former premier to receive the honour under the post-war constitution. Before him, former Prime Ministers Shiguru Yoshida, Isa Kusato, and Yasuhiro Nakasan were conferred with the same honour. Abe, Japan's longest-serving Prime Minister, was assassinated on 8 July while he was giving a speech on a street in the city of Nara. India-born Geeta Gopinath became the first woman and second Indian to feature on the wall of former chief economists of the International Monetary Fund. The first Indian to achieve the honour was Raghuram Rajan, who was Chief Economist and Director of Research of IMF between 2003 and 6. Gopinath was appointed as IMF's Chief Economist in October 2018 and was later promoted as the IMF's first Deputy Managing Director in December last year. The U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum, USISPF, has recognized former Indian Army Chief General Manoj Mukund Narvane for his contribution to fostering ties between India and the U.S. with the Public Service Award. According to the USISPF, General Narvane improved defense alliances and increased interoperability between the U.S. and India while serving as the Chief of Staff of the Indian Army. Recognizing his contribution in strengthening of economic relations between Japan and India, the government of Japan announced conferment of Order of the Rising Sun, Gold and Silver on Narayanan Kumar, the vice chairman of Sanmar Group and former president of the Confederation of Indian Industry. The Consulate General of Japan said that Kumar made it easier for businesses to operate in India. Since 2015, Kumar has served as President and then as Chairman of the Indo-Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Our next section is Persons in News. Dinesh Gunavardhane a veteran politician and a close ally of the Rajpakshe family was appointed as Sri Lanka's 15th Prime Minister amidst an unprecedented economic and political crisis. Prime Minister Gunavardhane has also been given an additional portfolio of public administration home affairs, provincial councils and local government. A stalwart of Sri Lankan politics, Gunavardhane, 73, earlier served as the Foreign Minister and Education Minister. He was appointed as Home Minister in April by then-President Gotabaya Rajpakshe. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced his resignation after he was abandoned by ministers and most of his conservative lawmakers. The crisis comes as Britons are facing the tightest squeeze on their finances in decades in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic with soaring inflation and the economy forecast to be weakest among major nations in 2023. Voting for the Conservative Party's leadership election is due shortly with Lee's Truss leading the race for Boris Johnson's successor. Draupadi Murmu took oath as 15th President of India at a ceremony in Parliament's Central Hall in New Delhi on 25th July. She is the first tribal, second woman and the youngest President of India. Murmu took a political plunge in 1997 by joining the Bharatiya Janata Party. A legislator from the Rai Rangpur Assembly constituency in the years 2000 and 2004, she was conferred Neelkant Award for the Best MLA by the Odisha Assembly in 2007. 
In 2015, Murmu became the first woman governor of Jharkhand. She also became the first woman tribal leader from Odisha to be appointed as the governor of a state. Former Niti Aayog CEO Amitabh Kant has been appointed as the new G20 Sherpa as India takes over the G20 presidency later this year. He replaces Union Minister Piyush Goyal. India will take over G20 presidency from Indonesia on December 2nd. The Sherpas are in charge of carrying out negotiations and building consensus among leaders. They are also responsible for convening working groups and special events throughout the year. Indermeet Gill has recently been appointed as Chief Economist and Senior Vice President of Development Economics of the World Bank. He will succeed American economist Carmen Renhardt for the post. He is the second Indian to take up the coveted role after Kaushik Basu. Gill brings with him two decades of operational working experience at the World Bank. In his previous stint from 1993 to 2016, he held several leadership positions including Director for Development Policy in the Office of the World Bank Chief Economist and Regional Chief Economist for Europe and Central Asia. Moving on to our next section Places in News. In the month of August, four male and four female African cheetahs will be imported from Namibia and another 12 from South Africa for soft release in a compartmentalized enclosure ready at Kuno National Park in Madhya Pradesh to establish the cheetah into its historical range. The translocation described as the world's largest intercontinental animal translocation comes 70 years after the last surviving cheetah in india was recorded to have been hunted down in chatisgarh in 1952 the park originally developed to be the second home for asiatic lions in india besides gir was selected as a habitat for the african cheetah by a supreme court mandated expert committee in january 2021 A report by the National Monuments Authority called for the Mangarh Hill Top in Rajasthan to be designated as a national monument in honor of 1500 Bhil tribal freedom fighters. The hillock situated at the Rajasthan Gujarat border is a site of a tribal uprising. On 17th November 1913, British forces opened fire on tribals gathered at the site who were holding a meeting in protest led by a leader from the community Govind Guru killing over 1500. Moving on to the major highlights from the category of national news. The US House of Representatives passed by voice vote a legislative amendment that approves waiver to India against the punitive Katsa sanctions for its purchase of the S400 missile defense system from Russia to help deter aggressors like China. The legislative amendment was passed as part of an N block that is all together as a single unit amendment during floor consideration of the national defense authorization act and was authored and introduced by indian american congressman ro khanna in other news ministry of labor and employment finalized the rules under four labor codes last month which include the wage code the code on industrial relations the code on work special safety the code on health and work conditions and the social and occupational safety code union government's new labor codes allow capping daily working hours from the current 8 to 12 while weekly work hours stay capped at 48 employers can step towards a 4 day work week but the codes allow them to increase daily work hours from 8 mandated now to 12 daily It is important to note that the new labor code permits individual states to set the settlement timeline according to what the state governments consider it reasonable. Amid an ongoing police investigation into the Delhi government's new excise policy and a face-off with the Lieutenant Governor who has sought a CBI probe, Deputy Chief Minister Manish Sisodia rolled back the new liquor policy with liquor being sold only through government outlets in the capital. The new excise policy was introduced in Delhi in November last year. It made sweeping changes to the nature and functioning of liquor trade in the city. 
the government exited the customer end of the trade entirely shutting all government run liquor vents and sale of liquor was handed over exclusively to private players open network for digital commerce the private non-profit company established by the department for promotion of industry and internal trade of the government of india to level the e-commerce playing field aims to open up the network for public access by august the section 8 company has extended the pilot to lucknow the sixth city after delhi ncr bengaluru bhopal shillong and coimbatore a UPI type protocol ONDC will enable discovery and shopping of products and services from partnering entities across the member applications on its network the solution aims to break the duopoly of amazon and walmart bagged flipkart on the e-commerce market in india and provide a level playing field for digital sellers in the country Assam Chief Minister Hemant Biswa Sharma and his Arunachal Pradesh counterpart Pema Khandu have signed an agreement to end border issues between the two states and decided to restrict the number of disputed villages to 86 instead of 123. The two states share 804.1 km long border. The grievance of Arunachal Pradesh which was made a union territory in 1972 is that several forested tracts in the plains that had traditionally belonged to hill tribal chiefs and communities were unilaterally transferred to Assam after Arunachal Pradesh achieved statehood in 1987 a tripartite committee was appointed which recommended that certain territories be transferred from Assam to Arunachal Assam contested this and the matter is in the supreme court next we have major highlights in the category international news The ongoing conflict between Russia and Ukraine entered its fifth month with the crisis showing no signs of abating. On July 21, Russia attacked Kharkiv, Ukraine's second biggest city in one of its most crowded areas. Turkey, a country with the second largest standing army among NATO members, brokered a deal on July 14 with Russia, Ukraine and the UN to resume Ukrainian grain exports that had been blocked by Moscow the disruption in global grain supplies precipitated by the war Russia and Ukraine account for nearly one third of the world's wheat supplies has exacerbated food security particularly in African and Middle Eastern countries due to both higher prices and supply issues one day after striking the deal to resume grain exports Russian missiles struck the Odessa port which is a key black sea terminal raising doubts on Moscow's intentions With a view to avoid any potential negative consequences for food and energy security around the world resulting from the Russia-Ukraine conflict, the EU has decided to extend the exemption from the prohibition to engage in transactions with certain Russian state-owned entities for agricultural products and the transport of oil to third countries. Russian state-owned companies Rosneft and Gazprom will now be able to ship oil to third countries under an adjustment of EU sanctions agreed by member states. Last month, Federal Reserve raised interest rates by 75 basis points for the second straight month and Chair Jerome Powell said a similar move was possible again. Policymakers facing the hottest cost pressures in 40 years lifted the target for the federal funds rate to a range of 2.25 to 2.5%. That takes the cumulative June-July increase to 150 basis points, the steepest since the price-fighting era of Paul Walker in the early 1980s. While many are worried that the economy is verging on recession, Fed officials see the glass as half full, with the strong labor market allowing the economy to withstand rapid monetary tightening. However, the statistics of contraction of US economy for a second straight quarter between April and June is fueling recession fears. Gross domestic product declined at an annual rate of 0.9% in the second quarter, following a bigger drop in the first 3 months of the year, according to the Commerce Department. Two quarters of negative growth is commonly viewed as a strong signal that a recession is underway. 
As consumer prices across Europe soar at the fastest rate in generations, Frankfurt also took a powerful step to control rapid inflation amid mounting concerns over an economic slowdown. In the first move of its kind in over a decade, the European Central Bank raised its three interest rates half a percentage point, an increase that was twice as large as forecast and that allows similar measures taken by the Federal Reserve and dozens of other central banks around the world this year. Amid fears over Europe's energy supply from Russia and with the economic outlook worsening, the central bank said it chose to front-load its rate increases. The International Monetary Fund has cut global growth forecasts, warning that the downside risks from high inflation and the Ukraine war were materializing and could push the world economy to the brink of recession it left unchecked. Global real GDP growth will slow to 3.2% in 2022 from a forecast of 3.6% issued in April, the IMF said. It added that world GDP actually contracted in the second quarter due to downturns in China and Russia. The fund cut its 2023 growth forecast to 2.9% from the April estimate of 3.6%, citing the impact of tighter monetary policy. The IMF cut its Eurozone growth outlook for 2022 to 2.6% from 2.8% in April, reflecting inflationary spillovers from the war in Ukraine. But forecasts were cut more deeply for some countries with more exposure to the war, including Germany, which saw its 2022 growth outlook cut to 1.2% from 2.1% in April. China's leaders have also acknowledged that the struggling economy won't hit its official 5.5% growth target this year and said they will try to prop up sagging consumer demand but will stick to strict anti-COVID-19 tactics that disrupted manufacturing and trade. In other news, the World Health Organization has activated its highest alert level for the growing monkeypox outbreak, declaring the virus a public health emergency of international concern. The rare designation means the WHO now views the outbreak as a significant enough threat to global health that a coordinated international response is needed to prevent the virus from spreading further and potentially escalating into a pandemic. Although the declaration does not impose requirements on national governments, it serves as an urgent call for action. In other news, Turkey has agreed to support Finland and Sweden's NATO membership bids, removing a major hurdle to the two countries joining the alliance. A joint memorandum on the matter was signed by Turkey, Finland and Sweden in Madrid. The two nations formally applied to be part of the security alliance in May, propelled by Russia's invasion on Ukraine. Earlier, Turkish President Rajab Tayyip Erdogan had said repeatedly that Turkey wouldn't support the bids, accusing the two countries of harboring members of the separatist militant Kurdistan's Workers' Party, also known as PKK, which Turkey views as a terrorist organization. The next category is news from the field of business, economy and industrial sector. Billionaire Elon Musk pulled the plug on his much-talked-about and controversial $44 billion deal to buy Twitter, accusing the company of misleading statements about the number of fake accounts. Twitter's chairman, Brett Taylor, said the board will pursue legal action to enforce the merger agreement. The terms of the deal require Tesla and SpaceX boss Elon Musk to pay a $1 billion breakup fee if he does not complete the transaction. On the economic front, India is expected to expand 7% in fiscal 2022-23, slower than a previous estimate of 7.4% and the central bank's 7.2% projection, according to a survey by India's leading industry body. The Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industries quarterly survey said the war in Ukraine is likely to keep inflation high and dent consumer demand. The Reserve Bank of India was expected to stay hawkish to tackle elevated inflation, the survey of top independent economists showed. Morgan Stanley also lowered its forecast for India's fiscal 2022-23 growth to 7.2% from 7.6% earlier this week, citing weakening global trade.
The Reserve Bank has asked banks to put in place additional arrangements for export and import transactions in Indian rupees in view of increasing interest of the global trading community in the domestic currency. Before putting in place this mechanism, banks will require prior approval from the Foreign Exchange Department of the Reserve Bank of India, the central bank said in a circular. The Union Cabinet cleared the merger of Bharat Broadband Network Limited into the state-owned telecom operator Bharat Sanchar Nigam Limited during the Cabinet meeting. With the merger, BSNL will get an additional 5.67 lakh kilometer of optical fibre, which has been laid across 1.85 lakh village panchayats in the country using the Universal Service Obligation Fund. Currently, it has an optical fiber cable network of over 6.83 lakh kilometers. In addition, the Union Minister Ashwini Vaishnav also announced a revival package of Rs 1,64,156 crores for BSNL during the cabinet briefing. The last approval for such revival package was given in the year 2019. After a long wait, the Reserve Bank of India has started handing out the payment aggregator licenses to eligible players. Pine Labs, Razorpay and American payments player Stripe have become the first players to receive the in-principle approval for the license. In a new set of guidelines issued in March 2020, RBI had mandated that all PAs shall be authorized by RBI. For this, the regulator instructed non-bank companies offering PA services to apply for authorization by June 30, 2021, which was later pushed to September 30, 2021. For e-commerce and other players, in the absence of the license, they will either have a tie-up with a bank that can aggregate payments on their behalf, driving up costs for payment collection services, or they will have to depend on a PA leading to more business for these licensed entities. Moving on to our next category, meetings and summits. Leaders of the Group of Seven, which is G7 countries, met in the Schloss Almau National Monument, nestled in Germany's Bavarian Alps, for a three-day summit from June 26. Leaders went into the G7 meeting with several critical topics on the agenda, such as global economy, sustainable planet and energy security, etc. However, in hindsight, they didn't manage to adequately address all the relevant energy transition issues, an alarming sign before COP27 later this year. The key takeaways of the summit are ending new direct public support for unabated fossil fuel energy by the end of 2022, a fully or predominantly decarbonized power sector by 2035, a highly decarbonized road sector by 2030 by stimulating zero-emission light-duty vehicles, including zero-emission public transport and public vehicle fleets, net zero emissions from international aviation and shipping by 2050, Stepping up efforts to collectively reduce global anthropogenic methane emissions by at least 30% below 2020 levels by 2030 in line with the Global Methane Pledge. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, US President Joe Biden, Israeli Prime Minister Yair Leipid and UAE President Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan met at the first virtual summit of the four-nation grouping I2U2. The leaders expressed their determination to leverage well-established markets to build more innovative, inclusive and science-based solutions to enhance food security and sustainable food systems. India, UAE, France held their maiden trilateral meet to explore potential cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region, including in maritime security, blue economy and regional connectivity, and food and energy security. The three sides exchanged perspectives on the Indo-Pacific region and explored the potential areas of trilateral cooperation including maritime security, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, blue economy, regional connectivity, cooperation in multilateral flora, energy and food security, innovation in startups, supply chain resilience and cultural and people-to-people -people cooperation, officials said, adding, they also discussed the next steps to be taken for furthering trilateral cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region. 
Moving on to our next category, science and technology. Scientists have discovered a novel material that can emit, detect and modulate infrared light with high efficiency making it useful for solar and thermal energy harvesting as well as for optical communication devices. The discovery has significant potential in the strategic arena of defense and space as well as the power sector. Moving on to our next category of sports. Elena Rybakina became the first player from Kazakhstan to win a Grand Slam title by beating Tunisian third seed Ons Jebula in a gripping Wimbledon final. Rybakina, 23, became the youngest Wimbledon singles champion since 2011. Novak Djokovic produced a returning masterclass to surge to a championship match victory against Nick Kyrgios at Wimbledon and claim his fourth consecutive crown at the grass court major. Djokovic's seventh triumph in London draws him level with legendary American Pete Sampras' tally of singles trophies won at the All England Lawn Tennis Club. Olympic champion Neera Chopra clinched his first top three finish at the Diamond League meeting with a national record-shattering effort, but missed the 90 meters mark by a whisker. The 24-year-old opened with a stunning throw of 89.94 meters, just six centimeters shy of the 90 meters mark, the gold standard in the world of javelin throw, and that effort eventually turned out to be his best as he finished second. World champion and season leader Anderson Peters of Grenada won the competition with the best throw of 90.31 meters, which he came up with in his third attempt. Chopra also won the silver medal in the men's javelin throw final at the World Athletics Championships in Eugene, Oregon with a best throw of 88.13 meters which he registered with his fourth attempt. Grenada's Anderson Peters won the gold medal with the best throw of 90.54 meters. Chopra had won Indian Athletics maiden gold in the Tokyo Olympics last year. He is only the second Indian to have won an individual gold in the Olympics after shooter Abhinav Bindra, who clinched the yellow medal in 2008 Beijing Games. PV Sindhu won the first Super 500 title of her career when she defeated reigning Asian champion Wang Zi Yi off in the final of the Singapore Open. The victory comes after a rough stretch on the Asian leg with back-to-back -back losses to her nemesis Tai Zhu. This is her first 500 or better final in 2022. This is an important marker for the world number 7 while the rankings are still frozen. With this, we have come to the end of this month's edition of GK Capsule. We hope you like the coverage of topics in our monthly edition. Do also watch our other online videos. Happy learning! Thank you!